We're going to see foreclosures this month, next month, at the end of this year. And then it's going to take the banks a few months to get those processed and maybe back on the market. And that's where I'm kind of predicting Q1, Q2, late Q2 next year for a wave of properties, multifamily properties. That- Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. Welcome back, my Grid to Wealth listeners. Today, we're going to be talking to Bill Ham, who is a true real estate entrepreneur. I think if there's anything in the real estate that needs to be done, which is including buying a duplex and flipping and this and that, our guest today's guest has actually done that. Nowadays, he's focused predominantly on multifamily. He's an owner operator. A lot of them is in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but we'll talk to them about it. Bill, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, thanks, sir. I appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Bill, before we go into the the wonderful world of real estate that we all live in and what's doing there, when you hear the term migrate to wealth, what does it what does it mean? Migrate to wealth. My first thought is migrate to education, you know, because I don't think that you're if you get lucky without an education, then then you're if you get wealthy without education, you're probably just lucky when you say. Yeah. And I say education, I don't mean like college degree. I mean, you know, like what we're doing right here, learning and figuring out your craft. Um, that's how I, I got where I was. A lot of, a lot of education. Awesome. What was your migration to build story, buddy? Well, I uh, started off as a corporate pilot and then today I am now a multifamily owner operator, right? I've been doing it about 20 years. So I was a pilot by trade, flying airplanes, realized I was not a very good employee And so I started reading. I studied for about a year, studying real estate, just reading all the current books and things that people read, kind of getting, you know, my legs under me. I saw friends of mine flipping houses and doing deals. And I realized that, you know, they were as dumb as I was, right? We were all at the same bar last night at the same place. And they wake up and they go out and flip a house and make what I was making, you know, in one or two transactions, they would make what I was making all year long working. And I thought something's wrong with this because these these people are just like me, right? There's nothing special about them. And so I started reading, I started studying, spent about a year doing that. And that's when I bought my first duplex. And, you know, like a good entrepreneur, I decided to walk away from the career of the of a, being a pilot aviation career with the duplex. It was about 10 grand in savings, is, is life savings. Ooh, time. Wow, Bill. And you are a true, you're a yeah, true. Yes, so I was not, not rich. I had 10 grand and the deal was cash flowed about 300 bucks if nothing broke. And, and that's what I went into real estate with full time. I've been here ever since. Um, I love it. I mean, you basically burnt the burnt boat. Yes, <laughs> I've heard no that plan B. There is no plan B. There's only plan A. It was no plan A to work. That's amazing. Well, and I was I was I was 28 years old. So you know, at the time, uh, no no kids, no no real life debt. You know, so it was an easier thing for me. I don't necessarily recommend people listening go do something dramatic right out with their job like that. Why? It was the right move for me. Let's go back in time a little bit. Why did you invest in? What about real estate spoke to you? Well, um, leverage. That's it. That's an easy answer. Leverage because I had no money, no education, and no experience. And real estate was one of those areas that by learning to solve problems, I could gain leverage. So let's say I had decided to buy stocks or bonds or something like that, right? You really can't go to the bank and say, I want to go get a loan to go buy a bunch of stocks not for a normal person anyway. And so that's, you know, real estate, you can get that sort of leverage. And that's what I did. I went out and learned to solve problems. My first 402 units, I never walked into a bank and got a mortgage. All 402 units in the beginning, first 402, were some sort of creative finance. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on one second. Uh, Did you say 402 units, 402? Yes. Yeah, that was my first portfolio. I've been over a thousand, but the first portfolio was 402. Yeah. All creative finance. So that's basically the answer as to why real estate is because I was able to get in using that leverage and I was able to exchange education and hard work for money that I didn't actually have at the time. I, my mind stuck at 402. I stopped listening out of 402. Let's go back to it. Let's go back to the number 402. Sure, sure. So you were a pilot. You didn't necessarily love doing what you were doing there. And then you jumped into your first duplex, which started to cash flow, which is probably good because otherwise you may not have been triggered to do something else. How did you right. grow from that 
to 402. And and how much time oh. did it take you? Give us some perspective. Yeah, one one brick at the time is how I did. <laughs> literally, I took me to go from two to four oh two, probably four years or so, yeah, five years, four years, That's several years. Really aggressive, years. right? That's very aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got in. Well, I got in and started flipping houses and, and doing smaller transactions like that. And then my first sort of proper multifamily unit deal was uh, nine units. I mean, besides the duplex. Right. But nine units was my first sort of true multifamily deal. And then from there, a 20, a 27 unit, a 44 unit. And then I started getting into the larger ones from there on out, being 152 units uh, and so forth. So, on. so that's how. Even for, uh, uh, even for the 150 unit, you used creative financing. You did not go to the bank. I did actually. <clears throat> that was in the first 102 units. Yes, I was able to. It was interesting. I did a combination of seller financing and syndication. So I raised the down payment money from investors and the seller was able to carry back a a mortgage. So with the down payment money that I gave the seller, the seller was able to pay off their loan. (laughs) Now they own the property free and clear. So they then carry back full mortgage for me. So I still put down 20%, but I I syndicated that with limited partners and the seller carried back 80% financing. So that's how I got into larger. Do you still own that property or? I literally just sold it about a year and a half ago after uh, almost 11 years of ownership. So it was the longest. That's a minute. Perfect time to uh, sell, man. Perfect time. time. You timed it very well. So it's amazing. Yes. Well, congratulations yes. on that. Sold off much. It did well on the sale, yes. Congratulations on that. So, so Bill, help us understand what kept you going because it seemed like you went through the path of I'm going to own a rental property, and instead of owning a single family or a condo, you have a duplex, which is still a single family, like because that's your mind can easily wrap around it. Then you went into fix and flip. Then you went into multifamily. Help me understand, and our listeners understand that progression, if if that's called progression or not. Sure, help us understand. Really, I was, yeah, I was just doing whatever business could get done, whatever I could accomplish. And so when I first started out, that's where I was doing houses and flips and things of that nature, because that's where the distress was. This was in the 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, I was in middle Georgia at the time, a little south of Atlanta. And so that that was sort of the market availability where houses and things of that nature. So that's where I flipped and did things like that until I was able to slowly get into multifamily. And again, multifamily, I went and heard someone speak, a teacher, a guru speaking about multifamily. And I listened to the individual and I thought, that's for me, you know, and, and it was economy of scale is, is what got my yeah. attention. You know, I was doing houses and, and this individual said, gosh, you can do, you know, the same amount of business with all, all these houses under one roof. So instead of 10 properties, you got to ride around to all day long. How about 10 units on one property under one roof? Okay. Everything's the same and everything's set up the same. You know, and I heard this and it really kind of uh, resonated with me. And I thought, yeah, if I want to build a true and proper business, not just flipping and, and kind of being a landlord, but I want to build a real investment business, I realized it was going to be hard to do with only single family and that I needed to move into commercial real estate to build the, the size business that I wanted to build. I love that. I think that we've heard that story on this show time and again where everyone's moving into this asset class, real uh, multifamily asset class, really because of the scale. Right? You can own 100 single units or you can own 100 units in a single building. The amount of effort to maintain is lower. The amount of paperwork you do is lower. The amount of time it takes is probably lower. One could argue <clears throat> that it may take you a longer time to find 100 units versus to find a single family house. That timing is different, but the amount of paperwork and everything else that you do for one unit versus 100 unit, it's actually the same. And arguably, it's lesser in a multifamily environment. And you have to open up your personal records and everything else, right? So I think we've heard that story time and again, and you're again one of the successes who transitioned from your corporate job to, 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 to duplex and then into multifamily, and you've been doing it for a while. How long have you been doing that again, Bill? 20 years now. 20 years now. And is the approach right this year is 20 years now. 20 years. Perfect. Well, congratulations. Is this, is multifamily the bread and butter now for you or you're still doing other things? 
it is my, the business that I've been in for 20 years. It always will be. I also teach as well. So I do, you know, provide sort of education in the multifamily space. That's a side business that I do. But uh, yeah, between either doing multifamily or teaching multifamily, that's it. Yep. So tell us, tell us what's happening. How do you see the multifamily world right now? Because there's a lot of, hmm. it's a very interesting, interesting time. <laughs> very interesting time. Yeah, right? that's, that's, that's a very interesting market at the moment. I think that we are in a heavy transition period at the moment and that there is going to be a lot of distress in the next several months. Between this month, uh, end of the year, maybe first month of next year. So we're going to see some distress. We're going to see some foreclosures. We're going to see the market shake up a little bit. But I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity come Q1, Q2 of next year. So sort of March, April, May, June, around that time next year, I think we're going to see a lot of purchasing opportunity. So if you're in the business and you're, oh, you own multifamily, you want to kind of take a look at your loan, make sure you don't have any loan issues, maturity issues come and do. And if you're looking to buy, my suggestion is sit tight for about four months and then you're going to have a really great opportunity. Ooh, why four months? Why not six? Why not 10? <clears throat> What's the magic number? Well, because what we have going on right now is what we in the business are kind of calling red October. Between October and November, Right now, this year or this of this year, this month, next month, we have over eight billion dollars in loan maturity, mostly short term loans that were originated around two years ago. And so what has occurred is after pandemic, after the lockdown, everybody was flush with stimulus money as well as coming out of the lockdown. And there was a huge run of purchasing multifamily. The prices at the time were very, very high. And so what a lot of people were doing were justifying the purchase price with, say, like an interest-only loan or something like that. And in my opinion, that's a mistake. But besides that, everybody went out and got a lot of short-term interest-only adjustable rate loans, right? It's kind of always the same thing we saw in 08 with houses, except this time it's been multifamily. Two years later, the rates have more than doubled. And those loans are now maturing October, November, right now. So we have $8 billion in these short-term loans all coming due in October, November. When I say coming due, I mean these loans are not fully paid off. They are balloon notes. And so there's a balance due at the maturity date. And so a lot of these people are not going to have the value in their property to be able to refinance or exit. And so step one, the bank or lender would come to the seller and say, hey, you're, you're upside down in value, not a problem. Just write us a chip back. You know, bring a lot of equity to the deal, and then we can extend the loan or refinance. Well, right there is going to be an issue for a lot of people. You're talking about bringing a fair amount of capital to these deals. And in there is where I think we're going to see a, a wave of foreclosures. It's going to take the banks 90, 120 days or more to sort of take process, take possession of the asset, get it back on the market. So that's where I'm kind of saying I think we're going to see foreclosures this month, next month, at the end of this year. You know, and then it's going to take the banks a few months to get those processed and maybe back on the market. And that's what I'm kind of predicting Q1, Q2, late Q2 next year for a wave of properties, multifamily properties that will got it for sale, I, probably highly discounted as well. Yeah, and I think that we, because we're already seeing the drops in, in price because a lot of we people have. who are selling in this market are selling for a reason because it's not the perfect market to sell if you can hold on for a few more years. Most people are choosing not to, but if you are, it's for most likely the reason that you're not able to service the debt or you're hitting that point where your debt's coming to you and you're nervous. So which essentially means that you're able to, you want to mm -hmm. okay taking a haircut on some of the profits and putting the deal on the profit. Like I think the Phoenix market, we saw what 20, 30% drop in multifamily in some cases, unless you bought it 20% low, but most people didn't, most people overpaid which is kind of like the, the frenzy of the 2008 time frame, or maybe 2003 to 2006 time frame, everything was going up because no one thought the market can ever crash. I think same thing's happening in the multifamily right now. So if somebody were to position themselves, Bill, how can they position themselves? Because this four-month time frame, let's say this is true, which I have full reason to believe it is, there are a lot of bills looking to acquire those just yeah. trust assets. And when there's a lot of bills trying to, including socket, to acquire these deals, they're going to get bid up. So how do you recommend people position themselves as they're looking and also both as an active investor and as a passive investor, right? Because as a passive investor, you have to figure out 
Del, did Socket overpay for this deal, right? right. Del Socket has no idea how much Bill paid for or offered it, but Socket has a perspective because they're in the similar markets, right? I understand how much, what Bill's capability is or tolerance level is. So I'm going to go write my offer a little bit higher if I really want the deal. So give it from both the active and the passive investor perspective. How would you, how do yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Active investor, what I will tell you if you're active is that you're going to need to secure lending and debt, basically, because that's going to be the toughest issue going forward is debt. The lending is is not going to be available for less experienced individuals, so we're going to see a big cri- criteria tightening up from lenders. So point there is you're really going to want to make sure you have your, your borrowing team in place. You need to make sure that you have experience like kind. So if you own a 10-unit apartment complex and you're out looking to buy a 100-unit apartment complex, you're not likely to qualify for the debt on experience alone. So one, I would say really focus on putting your team together. Make sure you've got the the equity equal to the loan amount and you've got some experience. If you can do that, you'll be good. Get ready. Deals are coming your way. If you're a limited partner, yeah, you really hit the main point is now to go and vet your general partner, right? Where, where were they in 08? What were they doing? How many deals have they done? If you're a limited partner, and this is this is advice I'm giving everyone that I know that's a limited partner, most people are probably not going to do this. But what I recommend is if you're invited to a deal by a general partner, you know, ask them if they have other properties. And if the answer is yes, I would want to see financials on all those properties. And that's going to be a bit of an aggressive ask. I understand that. But what I'm saying here is that someone who's out raising money right now or inviting you to a deal may have other deals that are currently distressed assets. And they may you may not see those assets, right? We are often investing as much in the property as the person. And if the, the main partner is has got their mind on a bunch of other deals that are going bad in their life, that can affect the investment that you're investing in. So that's where I would just kind of say, they ask, ask that general partner if they have a portfolio. The answer is yes. You really want to check into the health of the rest of the portfolio before and investing in the deal. If the general partner is not willing to share the financials, is there an alternative way of getting there without asking the finances? Because I could see some GPs, general partners, having a tough time in sharing the entire numbers because not because they want to hide something, because if you think about it, you may be my competition and you're also a limited partner. And now I'm sharing the exact numbers of all the finances and everything else of the property. And when it comes for grab, you may grab it because you have now more information about it. So yeah, I mean, you- that's possible. That's, yeah, I suppose that's possible. Yeah, the problem is, is I don't have a great answer for that. And I understand what I'm suggesting is that you basically go ask someone for some very personal information. I fully understand that. But I'm also suggesting to you that just because they're raising money and telling you that this is a good deal does not mean that all there is not me. Polio is right. in good shape. And that's where I don't have 100% answer as to how we vet that data. But I would want to really sit down and talk to that general partner and explain this point of view. Hey, I'm not trying to be overly nosy and get in your business particularly. I just want to know that if I'm investing in you, the person, you're in a decent financial position as far as the rest of your portfolio. If that individual was very cagey about that information, that might be all the information I need. You know what I'm saying? If they're very, they stonewall me with info and stuff like that, that might be all of the the info that I would would need out of that situation. So I I don't know. Again, I wouldn't exactly want to know everything about the deals, but I would want to know that um, maybe loan maturity. Maybe we could could go there. Maybe we could say to our general partner, okay, fine, instead of giving me financials, you know, which – is other investors' information. I do acknowledge yeah. that. So maybe instead of that, we we ask about loan maturity. You know, tell me about all your other properties. That's fair. If they have yeah. four other deals with loans maturing next month. I can guarantee you their their mind is elsewhere, right? And so yeah. maybe something along those lines. No, I, th- I think we could probably, because I'm thinking out loud here, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think I was thinking about it that maybe I could ask them to show me their debt service understanding, right? Kind of like, okay, my debt was a million dollars, have you first of all? Have you met every month or not? Because uh, some of the some of the operators are now belly up, even on the mortgage payments, and the banks just yeah. haven't caught up to them. Right. So that could be one information. The other information could be is how is your NOI doing as, as per the budget? What had you allocated? Because now you're not asking invasive financial reports. You're basically saying, can you give me a history of NOI? Right. There could yeah. be other ways to try and triangulate that information. Is I don't want to assume that every GP is going to hand over their finances. 
Some may, some may not. I agree. And I, and I do understand the nature of the question is aggressive, but that's why I kind of gave that caveat. But at the same time, not knowing the condition of the rest of their portfolio. Correct. Today. How do you evaluate somebody who started five years ago? Right? They're great operators. They, of course, they rode the market like everyone else. And okay, goes, you're going to go there first. They, they definitely rode the market, right? Because everyone, a monkey could have had a deal. and The deal would have gone right. Guess what? I think I was in a conference one time and Grant Cardone spoke there. He said, just, which is another crazy stuff to even think about it, like just buy the damn thing and let the market mistake your, or fix your mistakes. Like that's a lot of pressure on a general partner if that's their approach. Spray and pray, right? Versus somebody who has the understanding. Yeah, they started five years ago. And yeah, they rode the market, but they're actually great operators. How do you kind of some, come? How do you compare someone like that versus you, who actually has seen the 2008 market, right? Seen how do you evaluate them? Yeah, the only you know, it's a great question. The only thing I could tell you is that they, as you pointed out, those people have been untested. Up, they they've not been tested yet, and and so you can put all of that on paper. And you can say, well, they made this amount of money, and I made this amount of money, and this, that, and the other, and that's fine. But you don't know how that individual will react to a downturn or to a failure until it occurs to them. I can tell you about my failures. I can tell you the time I lost a property in that way. So I I have a resume. I can go back in time and say, well, this date, this thing, and that occurred. That's all I can tell you. And they may be great operators, and, and that's wonderful. But again, emotionally and mentally, you don't really know where they're at or how they're going to tolerate the stress of being an entrepreneur during a bad time until they go through a bad time and there's really nothing you can do about that you know i was talking to somebody the other day and they said well the one thing you have is, is time and they said that's the one thing you can't purchase you can't purchase experience you, you can't fast forward the clock and just purchase that so you know that's where i would say uh, do the best you can it's it's harder to find an operator who's been here pre-08 you know i mean the yeah. average individual has been in this business less than 10 years and if you've been in the business less than 10 years yeah, you've not really been tested. You've not seen a true down cycle like we're about to see. So I, I can't really go around and say, well, everybody should not do business with anybody that hasn't been in the business more than 10 years. That's silly. So, uh, you know, all I can say is, have they run other businesses? What's their business experience? Were they a nine to five employee and then quit and went into real estate full time? If so, you know, Okay, fine. You say they're a great operator. Something I always kind of tell people is to try and do some background check on these people. Social media. Did you see a big financial change in their lifestyle after quitting the job or going into real estate? All of a sudden, they got the the big house on the hill with the yellow Corvette and all this kind of stuff in very short order after kind of quit. That scares me because that says that's an individual who never had money before and now they've come across wealth for the first time. And they're indulging in it, and they've had a massive financial lifestyle change. Okay, I'm not begrudging anybody from driving a nice car, having a nice house. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, again, you've not been tested. This is your first rodeo, and the first time you've had some success, and this is what you do with it, right? You go right, right. out and buy the new car, the new house, and all this kind of stuff. That makes me a little concerned as far as a person and their personality. See, I'm more like that third little piggy who keeps saying, hey, the wolf's going to show up one day. Hey, build your house out of brick, right? And, and I feel like most everybody else, the other two little piggies go, I don't see any wolves, so why don't we play and, and have fun? And I'm over here going, no, 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 no. It's going to happen. It's just not today. But you, it will. And I feel like so many people that are, are have made money over the last five years have rushed out and spent it on things they really shouldn't have and have not prepared themselves for it. Correct, correct, correct. Are going to be corrected in that era. No, I love that, Bill. And Bill, if somebody is trying to get into this uh, becoming a passive, they're thinking about passive invest, investing, and of course the timing couldn't be worse right now. I, I mean, it's, it's worse than it isn't. It's actually good time, but it's also worse time because everyone's thinking about I could have gone five years before and I would have tripled or quadrupled my money. That's fine. So if somebody's starting out now and looking at multifamily ca- asset as an investment vehicle, what's some? How do you bring realism to the return? Right? How do they look at? Even the deal checks the filter because I know over the last few years, cash on cash was 10% sometimes, 12%, depending on what yeah. class you're buying. The cap rates were looked at a forward-looking cap rates, not a, not a back, not a, not a current cap rate. 
There's so many things going on, and I don't want to turn this into an unwriting class, but some high-level touch is saying that, you know what, doesn't mean that the filter criteria you're going to give you, I'm going to give you a caveat out of it to make sure that people understand it, doesn't mean you should not buy it, but all that means is from whatever you're telling us next, Bill, is going to be, you, they have some red flags, and you should go deeper. Sure. You should look into it more if these if yes. the scenarios are happening in, in the deal that's been presented to you. Yeah, so so I would say general answer is always a good deal is a good deal. Doesn't matter about the market or the the interest rate or the day of the week. I mean, if it's a good deal, it's a good deal by definition, right? So it doesn't matter about these other things. Now, what is a good deal? I think that's a better question. And that's also a personal answer. So what I would say for the average sort of LP, and again, uh, you know, I, we are not giving financial advice here, but yep. I would say that you still want your internal rate of return to be around 17 to 20%. And that you want cash on cash to still be seven or eight percent, and if you cannot produce that, then the prop, then you're overpaying for the asset. And that's my final answer to everything. Right? Is when people come in there and they say, "Oh, well, we got to put down more down payment. We got to do this. We got to do that." No, you don't. You need to pay less. That's the one answer that solves all the problems. Pay less. You're paying too much. And if you can't pay less, then don't do the deal. And if you can't do a deal, then go do something else until you can do a deal. But don't let the market dictate to you what a good deal is. You should know what a good deal is. And that's what I do. And so people say, oh, well, Bill, we don't see you buying deals right now. No, you're right. No, it's not that I'm not looking. It's not that I'm on the sidelines or, or anything like that. I just know what a good deal is. And yes, currently in this market, I'm not seeing a lot of those. And therefore, I turn around and make an offer that makes the deal a good deal, which is, of course, a considerably lower offer than the seller was expecting. And so at the moment, my offers are not getting accepted. But I would still say stick to the older parameters of what a good deal is. You know, I don't like real estate less than a six gap, personally. I don't like older properties. That's something else I would warn everybody about right now because infrastructure is getting hard to predict in its cost and its, in its expense. So plumbing, electrical, subflooring, things like that are getting uh, expensive and hard to predict and therefore making the numbers hard to predict. So for me personally, again, I'm not given this suggestion, but for me personally, I'm probably 1990s or newer, you know, in a six cap or better, you know, something of that range like in a good city. And I want to be able to get a good mortgage. I want to be able to get a, at least a five or a seven year mortgage, not something that's going to come due next week and um, push me into the market, have a big rate reset. So that's what I'm saying. A, a, a good property Six cap or better, good neighborhood, good area, 1990s or better, and stick to the old returns. That's what I'm looking for. Now, I'm not getting a lot of those deals accepted right now for everybody listening, but that's what a good deal would be for me. And I'm going to wait till it's important, right? Because I think what I have seen, and I'm sure you have seen it too, we have over rotated so much on the interest rates, which is, oh, I don't want to pay 7% interest rate. Now you're starting to see the deals that have assumable loans. And people have assumed the loan at 3% fixed rate, which is not coming due until next 10 years. I want to break, use this opportunity to bring it to the point that just because the interest rate is fixed does not mean it's a good deal. It may. Great point. Yeah. It may be a good deal. It could be a starting point. It's a, it's a good thing to have a fixed rate at 3% right now, which is great if you can find one. But that does not mean it's a good deal. You got to start looking into it. So I think at, to, your, to your earlier point, it's those parameters that you have as a passive investor is very important to go look beyond marketing, to go book, to go look beyond what a syndicator or a general partner is telling you, not because they're lying to you. They generally believe it's a good deal. They're not lying to you. They generally, you have to figure out, is it a good deal for you? And for that, you can't ask a general partner, what's a good rate of return nowadays? Well, that's not a valid question because at that point, if you ask the question before the deal, that's a different thing. But yeah, if you ask the question, well, can you give me an average cash and cash return? They're going to give you a number that's favoring their deal because they accepted that offer. So the yeah, same thing, you can go to a restaurant and ask the server, how's the food? You <laughs> always thought that, that was the dumbest question in the world. Why would you yeah. ask the person serving me the food, how's the food? Of course, they're going to tell you it's good. They're going to lie. It was the best for lower. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so again, to your point, why are you asking this loaded information from this zero partner that you know they're going to feed you back whatever info is going to fit their narrative? Yeah, right. absolutely. And, and that's on that point. What you really got to pay attention to as a limited partner is the parameters that they're using to create the returns. So if they show you, here's a deal and it's as a 
seven, eight, nine, 10% cash and cash, whatever. Okay, fine. Where does that return come from? Are you collecting that right now from cash flow today? Or is this going to be on the other side of renovation? Or are you raising your rents and things like this? I've seen some underwriting where the deal said, oh, 9% cash on cash. And you would think, well, that's a pretty good cash on cash return. And then when you really look at the fine print of the, the general partner's underwriting, they're planning on raising the rent 25% a year for the next yeah. four years in a row or something yeah. stupid. You know, And this is where that 9% shows up. When you break the deal down, they're not really cash flowing at all today. But but in the OM, you know, in this prospectus, it says, oh, we're going to make all this money. Okay, fine. But it's it's a projection. And that's where I think a lot of limited partners don't have the skill set to understand when someone is making up stuff or they're saying this is what's really occurring right now. Big difference. And it's important. And it's also, I think, as a limited partner, although I would love to say everything is passive, it's passive once you invest. But up until that time, you're very active because you have to understand that market. You have to look at is there 25% rate increase on the market? Can the market even sustain that? Right? You have to look deeper into these analysis. I'm not saying go analysis paralysis because then you'll never make a decision, but also don't jump on the first deal that Bill and Socket present to you that, hey, that's great, you yeah. could jump in. So also don't do that. There's somewhere between that, there's a, between these ends of the spectrum, there's a fine line where you're like, you know what, I need, I understand enough. Either I trust Bill or Socket enough because they, I've known their track record and everything that I'm going to just put the money in. Like I have several investors who are at this point, they're like, there's a deal there. Yeah, there is a deal. Here's the 100K, here's the 200K. It's there. But it, it didn't happen with them on deal one. It took a while for us to get there where they now understand what I look for and our values are aligned, our philosophies are aligned, our return metrics are aligned, and now they're, now they're comfortable making that jump. So for you as a listener, just because Bill and Saget are saying something, don't listen to us. I think listen, use this as as a step forward. Kind of like, what do I need to do? I need to build my own investment thesis, your personal investment philosophy, and say that, and test it out. Saying that, asking the general partners who don't have the deals, saying, I'm thinking about this, how realistic it is in this market. When you talk to five, 10 general partners, you'll figure out what that number is. You don't have to go do your own primary research. You can just do secondary research by talking to these people. Would you agree with that, Bill? Absolutely. Yeah. I always get multiple opinions because I think the other general partners who have nothing to gain from giving you some honest advice will call out the other general partners there trying to sort of come up with inflated numbers. You know, I know I have done that. So yeah, I think that's a great, get some other opinions. Yeah. Multiple opinions. Great. Definitely. Now don't take Bill's deal or Sake's deal and show it to each other and saying, what do you think about Sake's deal? Most general partners won't take that. But if you have questions about- Right. Not like that. Yeah. yeah, don't do that way. Don't offload everything to somebody else. Do your own analysis. And if you have holes in the question, holes in the deal and analyzation, you have questions, you can always ask on Bill, me, or somebody else who is in your network. Bill, we can go on and on. I love this. I love multifamily, and I know you do too. But we want to be respectful of your time here. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. So sure. we always, towards the end of our show, we always ask two questions from our guests. First question is, okay. if you go back to your 20-year-old self, maybe for you, we'll go back to, if you go back to your 28-year-old self, mm-hmm. when you, who left the job, lucrative job, for $300 per month cash flow and a $10,000 in savings, if you were to go back to that person now, knowing what you know now, what's one advice you'll give them so their migration in life becomes more intentional? You know, I don't know. I, I would not I'd probably try and go bigger sooner, maybe, you know, because I, I, I've been asked this similar question. Like, if you go back in time and change what thing would it be? And I really struggle with that question because I think, you know, if I went back in time and changed anything, then I wouldn't be here now. So I'm almost afraid to say that I would change anything or that I would say anything to my old self. But I, I you know, for, for having some answer, I would say that I probably spent too much time in single family believing that I couldn't do multifamily or believing that multifamily was out, you know, not for me or beyond my reach or my capability. And it was that mindset that when I got over and realized that I could do multifamily and I was capable of doing it. And yes, I needed help and yes, I needed partners. But once I got the information on how to do it, then I realized that was just a mindset issue. And so maybe that would be the one thing I would go back and try and 
you know, convince myself of that. You can do it. I, I love that answer. And the question was not really for you. I should have phrased it differently. The question was for the, another 28-year-old person who's listening to the show, right? Yeah. Uh, that, uh, yeah okay, then that advice. Yeah, that's a great question. Then that, that advice, I would tell people listening that second part, it's, it, you know, it, I run into when I'm talking to people and they say, I just can't imagine myself doing that. I mean, I can see myself doing a house or I can see myself doing you know, two units for, I can't see myself doing 50 units or a hundred right. units. And that's the problem right there. And that's probably the piece of advice I would leave everybody with is that it's not as hard as you think. It is, it does take work and it does take an education. But once you get that information together, you know, it doesn't take you being rich or some sort of special person to be able to do it. You can. And so that's one of the biggest things I see people that probably keep them from being successful at multifamily is that uh, just a mindset thing. And, uh, you know, and hey, if you have a problem with that, reach out to me. I can, I can help you out with that. But, you know, that's probably the biggest uh, thing I would tell. Awesome. You. Well, last question, buddy. Where do you feel, I mean, you, 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 in your business, you interact with a lot of people from different strata of life, right? Different demographics. As you reflect back on your interactions, where do you feel humanity as a whole should migrate to in the next few decades? A perception. We got to work on perception, responsibility and perception. That's the TK. That's where, we gotta, that's where humans have got to evolve, right? We got to evolve in our, our perception. That's, uh, I don't know quite how to put it into words, but that's where we're at. We got to have more awareness. And so I would say yeah, a higher level of responsibility is where yeah. humanity needs to develop themselves towards. How do we do that? I don't know. I'm, I'll, we'll I'll write that book when I have it. But. Yeah, well, that's perfect. Well, Bill, thank you again for coming on the show, buddy, and spending time and sharing your insights. I sure. love I love that conversation. Got a lot of value out of it. I'm sure our listeners will too. But where can people find you? Absolutely. Real Estate Raw. I have a website, realestateraw.com. So if you want to find out more information about working or multifamily, I have a tremendous amount of free information on there, realestateraw.com, R-A-W, right? And my email. Bill at gobroadwell.com. Feel free to email me. It's B I L L at gobroadwell.com. G O B R O A D W E L L. Yeah, shoot me an email. I am uh, love to answer questions and you can find me on, on social media pretty easily. Just Bill Ham Real Estate. Just search that and you'll find me. Awesome. Well, Bill, thank you again. We'll make sure all these resources are included in the show notes below. Thank you again for your time and thank you, listeners. If you're listening to this part, that means you've been gracious enough with your time to listen to the entire podcast. Thank you for that. We wouldn't be here without your support and your, and your time. So appreciate that. Thank you, Bill. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below.